Good evening. My name is Scott Flynn. I'm the administrator in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's uh, lecture on shoulder surgery with Dr. Weasel. At MedStar Georgetown University Hospital, we offer some of the most advanced care and treatment for a variety of shoulder uh, conditions. Tonight, we're going to hear from one of our orthopedic surgeons that specializes exclusively in shoulder and elbow surgery. Before we start, I have a few housekeeping notes. We have time reserved at the end to take your questions. As you listen to the presentation, feel free to write your questions on the card that have been provided in the middle of your table. After we hear from the speakers, uh, we'll be happy to take your questions. To help follow along, your folder contains an agenda with the presenter's bio, a copy of the presentation, along with two copies of the My Georgetown MD Community Newsletter that contains um, two of our shoulder patients. At the end of the evening, we'll, we would greatly appreciate if you could take a few minutes to complete the survey that's located in your folder so we can use your comments to continue to create beneficial community lectures in the future. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Brent Weasel. Dr. Weasel is a fellowship-trained orthopedic surgeon and chief of shoulder surgery at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. Dr. Weasel is an associate professor at Georgetown University School of Medicine and is an expert in the latest techniques, including minimally invasive arthroscopic surgery and reverse shoulder replacements. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brent Weasel. So, well, let's, well thank you guys for coming. Let's, let's uh, back up here. We'll, we'll get to those pictures in a second. Uh, uh, first, uh, it's a very nice introduction. Thank you very much, Scott. I want to start by thanking uh, our marketing team of uh, Pyle and Jenna, who really done an excellent job of putting this uh, event together tonight. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of you guys for coming. So, I mean, I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about shoulders. It's really what I do all day. I spend a lot of time studying them. Uh, and I always enjoy the opportunity uh, to kind of share that knowledge and hopefully use it to help some other people. Uh, and frankly, when we went to put this event together, we were expecting 75, 100 people. Um, and we really had uh, well over 200 people that wanted to come, so we really appreciate you all taking time out of your schedules to come here tonight and listen. Uh, and hopefully I can at least impart you with something that made it worth your time. Uh, so on that note, uh, this is sort of the plan for the night. We'll talk a few minutes about my background uh, and how being a shoulder and elbow surgeon is a little different maybe than being a general orthopedist or sports medicine doctor. Uh, we're going to go over the anatomy of the shoulder just so that we all know uh, what we're talking about and are coming from the same spot. And then I thought we'd spend some time talking about the two most common uh, problems that, uh, that we see in the shoulder, first being rotator cuff disease uh, and the second being uh, arthritis. Uh, and then uh, following that, uh, one of my uh, patients, uh, Barbara, has been gracious enough to come in. She's going to talk about her experience uh, with surgery for a rotator cuff tear and the recovery from that. So I am a uh, true Washingtonian. I was uh, raised over in Bethesda. I uh, went to St. Albans uh, and then uh, went to college at Georgetown and actually spent a year after college working as a healthcare consultant at the advisory board company down at the Watergate. Uh, the reason I stayed in Washington uh, is I was training for the Olympics in whitewater slalom kayaking, which is a sport sort of like downhill skiing, except that you're in a kayak, but going down rapids, uh, going through gates. And so, the national team for that centered uh, here in Washington. Uh, unfortunately, not so good for the shoulders. So uh, those pictures you see on the right uh, are actually my shoulder. So when I talk about shoulder surgery, I've been there. Uh, so uh, I hurt my shoulder just before the 96 Olympics, uh, so I couldn't go compete. Um, and at that point, uh, my parents told me I had to grow up and get a real job. Uh, so. Uh, as my wife likes to say, we then spent our 10 years in Philadelphia. So um, that's where I did all of my medical training. I went to medical school at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, stayed uh, to do my orthopedic residency there, and then did an extra year uh, specializing just in shoulder surgery at the Rockman Institute, which is really the premier place for shoulder surgery in the U.S. It's the busiest center in the country, um, which is at Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia. And then in 2008, I came back here uh, to start working at Georgetown. Uh, where I'm head of the shoulder service and uh, serve as an associate professor in the medical school. And I do all my surgery at Georgetown uh, and see patients there, but I also see patients uh, at 5454 uh, Wisconsin Avenue in Chevy Chase, which is right at the black building right across from Clyde's, uh, as well as uh, over in McLean, which I know, uh, having grown up in Maryland and we're in Maryland now, uh, may as well be in California. Uh, but I will actually tell you, the McLean office is, uh, in a lot of 
depending on the time of day, closer to right where we're standing right now uh, is closer to here than even the Chevy Chase office. Great office, parking, actually a great place to go. Uh, and it's good to go into Virginia every once in a while. They've, they've, they've got good beer and wine stores, it's a great place to go. So uh, before we jump into the shoulder, just a little bit on what's different between a shoulder and elbow surgeon uh, and some of the other folks that take care of our shoulder. So, when we used to train orthopedics, uh, and we still do train them this way, we all spend five years doing all parts of orthopedics, and that makes you a general orthopedic surgeon. Um, but about 20 years ago, we realized that the technology uh, and the sophistication of what we were doing was advancing to the point where it's very difficult for anybody to really be proficient at everything. And so at that point, people started subspecializing. I mean, you typically subspecialize in one joint or one area of the body. So you'll have people that do just hip and knee replacements. We have foot and ankle surgeons. We have hand surgeons. We have spine surgeons. Uh, and then we have uh, two types of surgeons that really specialize in the shoulder. Uh, one are sports medicine surgeons, uh, and their extra year of training is really in arthroscopic surgery. Uh, and so they do do uh, a fair amount of shoulder surgery because about 60% of what we do in the shoulder can be done arthroscopically uh, through a camera with small instruments. Uh, but uh, they also do, uh, the majority of what they do is actually knee surgery and then they do some hip and some ankle surgery as well and also take care of athletic injuries like concussions and, and that sort of thing. Uh, the second group that does uh, shoulder surgery uh, are the shoulder and elbow surgeons. Uh, and those are folks like myself, where that's all we do. Um, so we take care of, uh, kids really uh, all the way from adolescence that dislocate their shoulder uh, all the way up uh, through people through the rest of their life. Uh, and so we do both arthroscopic and open surgery, including fractures and, and shoulder replacements, uh, which we're gonna talk about here in a few minutes. Um, and so I think that gives us a, a little bit different perspective, uh, seeing the continuity of the shoulder over the entire lifetime. Um, and it's just a little bit different, uh, different view on things. And so, I mean, I, you know, this is really all I do. Um, you know, as my staff will make fun of me and be like, if they want to confuse me, instead of going right, left, right, we do two right shoulders and then a left. Um, but so there's, there's, there's no knees, there's no hips or anything else in there. Um, so that said, uh, in order to sort of talk about the shoulder, we got to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and so, you know, when you think of the skeleton, uh, we all obviously know the bones. Um, and anytime two bones meet, you have a joint. Um, and those joints are lined by uh, articular cartilage, uh, which make two surfaces essentially a thousand times smoother than ice that let the bones slide on each other. And then what the holds those joints in place are the ligaments, which you can think of as rubber bands uh, that cross the joint that allow them to move uh, but keep the joints where they're supposed to be. Uh, and then to actually move the joints, you need the muscles. Um, and anytime the muscle is attached to the bone, it goes through something called a tendon, uh, which is a, a fibrous cartilage or fibrous tissue um, that allows that muscle to insert in the bone, and that's what moves the joint. Uh, and in the shoulder, uh, you have the greatest range of motion uh, of any joint, major joint in the body, and so the, the muscles and the tendons become much more important uh, than they are in uh, some of the other joints, such as the hip joint, where the joint itself really uh, holds itself together. So when we talk about the shoulder, we're really not talking about one specific joint, we're actually talking about three. So you have the ball and socket joint, uh, that everybody thinks of. But you also have another joint where the collarbone meets the top of the shoulder blade. That's called the acromioclavicular joint. And then you have the joint where the shoulder blade uh, actually attaches to the back of the body, and that's the scapulothoracic joint. Um, we then do have those lig same ligaments uh, that span the ball and socket joint. But again, because the motion is so great in the shoulder, if those ligaments uh, were tight all the time, you wouldn't be able to move. And so the shoulder relies much more uh, on uh, the muscles uh, and the tendons associated with those muscles uh, than most joints. And that's why you hear so much about the rotator cuff, because the rotator cuff is those small muscles that helps stabilize the shoulder. So the rotator cuff is a series of four muscles. So in the front, you have the subscapularis, which is you're looking at the screen there. Uh, we're looking from the front at the picture on the left. Um, that's the biggest of the rotator cuff muscles. And then balancing that out in the back, if you look on the right picture, uh, you have uh, the infraspinatus and teres minor muscles. And then at the top, uh, you have the supraspinatus muscle, which is the one you hear the most about because that's the one that's most commonly torn and most causing, commonly causing pain. The reason for that is because as that 
supraspinatus muscle and then its associated tendon run out towards the ball, uh, they run underneath the top of the shoulder blade, that acromion there. And so the way it slides back and forth underneath the acromion uh, is uh, through a sac of tissue called the subacromial bursa. And that bursa can get inflamed and that can cause pain or the rotator cuff tendon itself can start to degenerate and then eventually uh, tear, also a source of pain. Uh, the other thing that can contribute to that is that roof uh, to that space, the acromion, can be different shapes. So if you look at that picture over on the right side of your screen, uh, you'll see the three different shapes that we see of acromion. Sometimes they're flat, sometimes they're curved, and sometimes they can have a big hook to it. And when people talk about having a bone spur in their shoulder, that's what they're talking about. Now, you go into the doctor, the doctor tells you you have a bone spur. That bone spur has actually been there uh, in all likelihood your entire life. The question is, why is it bothering you now? And it doesn't mean that we have to get rid of it in order to make you better. A lot of times we can make you better without removing it. Occasionally we have to remove it, but most of the time we can make you better without that. So when people come to see me for a shoulder problem, uh, they've typically had it for quite some time uh, and gotten a whole lot of opinions from everybody they know about it and heard just about everything from arthritis to bursitis to tendonitis to bone spur um, to impingement. Uh, to, oh my God, it's your rotator cuff, which a lot of people think is worse than death. Uh, and uh, so we're going to spend a little bit of time here now sorting through uh, kind of what causes problems with the rotator cuff uh, and, and what's really going on there. Uh, and that rotator cuff disease is by far the most common thing we see in the shoulder for the reasons we just talked about in the sense that uh, the shoulder really is driven by those four small muscles uh, and they help to stabilize the joint uh, and make it work. Um, and so... Uh, when you start to get pain from the rotator cuff, there are several places it can come from. That bursa, uh, that sac of tissue, uh, can get inflamed. Uh, that's called bursitis. Uh, the rotator cuff tendon itself can start to degenerate a little bit, and that's called impingement, uh, or that's called tendonitis. Uh, and then the cuff itself can start to tear. So you can get a partial tear of the cuff where some of the tendon is still intact, uh, but some of it's torn off, or you can get a full tear of the cuff to the sense that if you're inside the joint looking out at the acromion, Instead of seeing rotator cuff, you'll actually see through it. So it'll be a hole, and that hole can go anywhere from very small, less than a centimeter, uh, to what we call a massive rotator cuff tear, where it can be four or five centimeters big, and the entire cuff is torn off. Really, regardless of what the cause uh, of the pain is, uh, the symptoms, meaning what the patient will experience, uh, tend to be very similar. So prim primarily with these, uh, there is no specific injury. Um, it happens gradually over time, um, sometimes uh, from some overuse. The pain's almost always referred, uh, not up here, uh, but really over the lateral aspect of the arm. Um, and uh, you'll often get pain with lifting the arm, um, pain with reaching overhead, uh, and almost universally pain at night. Um, and it's often pain that'll wake you up from the middle, uh, middle of sleep. Um, certainly will bother you if you lie on that side at night. And then if there is a full tear of the rotator cuff, that's when we start to see some weakness. So the way we diagnose rotator cuff uh, problems uh, is really by listening to the patient. Um, and most of the time, just by hearing the story, I have a pretty good sense of what's going on. Um, after that, then we'll do an exam. Uh, we'll sort of look at how the shoulder's moving, uh, look for that weakness uh, to make sure that there's not a full thickness tear there, um, and then we'll get an x-ray. And you don't see the rotator cuff on the x-ray. This is an x-ray of a normal rotator cuff patient over here on the right, and it's a completely normal x-ray. The reason we're getting the x-ray is to look for something else, uh, make sure that there is an arthritis there, um, that there's not something unusual causing the pain like calcification uh, or any sort of uh, you know, uh, other uh, mass or anything else in the shoulder. Um, and if, assuming that x-ray is normal, uh, the next step at that point is really physical therapy. Um, and the vast majority of people that are having problems with uh, their rotator cuff, we can almost always make better with physical therapy. Um, and uh, we'll sometimes accompany that with a cortisone injection. Uh, and a cortisone injection uh, is a steroid injection, uh, which is a very, very strong anti-inflammatory. And the purpose of that is really to control the pain so that you're able to work with the therapist uh, and uh, then improve the biomechanics uh, and make those uh, symptoms go away. Uh, and the physical therapy will include some uh, what we call modalities, uh, which are things like heat and ice and ultrasound to help, again, improve the pain and the inflammation that's there. 
And then the real mainstay of it uh, is exercises. Uh, and what the exercises do is they strengthen up the rotator cuff muscles in the front and the back, uh, and those help to pull the ball down and make some more space underneath that uh, acromion uh, for the supraspinatus tendon and that subacromial bursa. Uh, and typically we'll do those with the physical therapist and then also uh, as part of a home exercise program every day. And about 80 to 90% of the time, that'll do the trick. If it doesn't, that's when we need an MRI scan. Uh, and the MRI is what actually lets us look at the rotator cuff and see what's going on with the tendon. Uh, so if you look here, uh, the picture on your left uh, is a normal rotator cuff. Uh, and so you can see that same uh, rotator cuff coming out uh, just like uh, you saw on the, the drawing uh, attaching uh, over there on the left side of the screen to the ball. If you look over to the right, uh, this is a patient with a full rotator cuff tear. Um, and what you see uh, is that white, just the arrow there is the end of the rotator cuff tendon uh, that should be attached out to the ball like it is on the other side of the screen. And then that uh, white area you see is fluid, and that's what fills in the tear. Um, and that's what we're looking for. Once you have a rotator cuff tear, uh, certainly that's sizable like that, those are the patients that tend to require surgery. Um, the good news with it is that opposed to what we would have done 25 years ago where this was an open incision about four or five centimeters uh, over the front of your shoulder and one or two nights in the hospital, uh, we now do it arthroscopically. Um, and so what that means is we're using a camera uh, and a series of specialized instruments, um, typically three or four holes uh, around the shoulder, each one uh, about five millimeters in size. Um, and essentially what we do is we go in there, uh, we take some suture and we pass it through the rotator cuff and then we pull the rotator cuff back out where it's supposed to go and sew it into place. And so if you look in the middle two images, uh, you'll see one of the instruments that we use uh, to pass those sutures up at the top. Uh, and then if you look just below that uh, in the middle of the screen, uh, you see what the suture anchors look like holding that tendon into place. Um, and then if we go farther to the right than that, uh, that is a, an arthroscopic photo, so that's what I'm actually looking at in the operating room uh, of a rotator cuff tear. Um, and then down below it, uh, you can see that same rotator cuff tear after we've repaired it. So uh, the surgery uh, itself at this point uh, is an outpatient surgery, um, but the hard part here is the recovery. Um, and I think Barbara will talk to you about that a little bit in a few minutes. Um, but it's a month in a sling after surgery, uh, another six to eight weeks after that, depending on how big the tear is, where you can use the arm at waist level, uh, but no reaching or lifting with it. And you're working with the physical therapist where they're moving your arm or you're moving the arm using the other arm at home to try and regain some of the range of motion. And during that time, we're waiting for that tendon to heal. And it really takes between 10 and 12 weeks for that tendon to grow back into the bone. At that stage, we then need to build the strength back up in the shoulder. So it's typically another three months of strengthening exercises with the physical therapist uh, to get you back to where you want to go. Um, but the good news is it is a good surgery. Uh, it's about 90 or 95% uh, good to excellent results. Uh, and at the end of that road, people tend to be very, very happy with it. So we're going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about arthritis. So we've talked about the rotator cuff, which is unique to the shoulder, and that's a tendon wearing out. So the other thing that typically wears out in the shoulder is the joint surface itself, and that's the cartilage. Uh, and so the definition of arthritis is when you wear out the cartilage that lines those joints. Um, and arthritis in the shoulder is the same thing as what you see in the hip and the knee. Again, it's that arthritis uh, wearing out, or is it, excuse me, it's that cartilage wearing out. The difference is in the shoulder, uh, there are two different types of arthritis. So you can have uh, what we call glenohumeral arthritis, which is the same as the arthritis you get in the hip and the knee, where all that wears out is the cartilage. In that case, your rotator cuff is still working well. Uh, what we tend to see is uh, like this picture over here on the left. Um, so if you look at the picture in the center, that's a normal shoulder. If you look over on the left, what you see is the space between the ball and the socket is now gone uh, because you don't see cartilage on an x-ray. Uh, cartilage shows up as clear space. And so once you see those two bones touching, uh, that's a bad thing because uh, that means the bone surfaces are touching and there's no cartilage left there. Uh, and then in response to that, what your body will do will be to make some more bone. Um, so if you look at uh, the bottom of that picture on the left, you can see a little bit extra bone on the ball, and that's what we call an osteophyte or a bone spur. Uh, the second type of arthritis that we can see in the shoulder uh, is something called rotator cuff tear arthropathy. And what that means is that you've worn out not just the cartilage surface, but also the rotator cuff. So now the ball, instead of saying, centered on the socket, uh, which is what the rotator cuff helps it to do, the ball now rides up and is sitting right underneath the acromion, uh, and again, you're missing the, the cartilage as well, so you also have the arthritis component in there. 
regardless of which type of arthritis you have, the symptoms tend to be fairly similar. Um, and again, this tends to happen slowly over time. Uh, it's a dull, achy pain, it is worse at night. It can be over that lateral aspect of the arm, uh, but it often is there as well as uh, kind of deep pain within the shoulder, uh, a lot of times in the back of the shoulder mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and then what really tends to hurt you here is, is moving the arm. Um, and you'll often feel kind of a catching or clicking when you move the arm. Um, and what that is, is those two surfaces that used to be a thousand times smoother than ice uh, starting to look a little bit like a gravel road. Um, and, and so that catching is exactly what you're feeling. Um, and so the diagnosis of this uh, is actually uh, in some ways a little bit easier to make um, because the x-ray really makes the diagnosis for you. Um, you know, so we, we, we get the same history, we do an examination and we'll often see uh, some loss of motion or some stiffness in the shoulder, uh, but then uh, on the x-ray uh, we'll see that joint space gone um, and we'll see the, sign, the typical signs of arthritis. A little bit more difficult to treat in the sense that uh, we, without surgery we can often make the symptoms better, but we can't make the disease itself go away. So there's no way uh, without surgery, unfortunately, to put the cartilage back. Um, although we often, uh, especially in the early stages, can really make the symptoms much better. And that typically consists of anti-inflammatory medicines. Uh, so medicines like uh, Advil or Aleve. Um, or I like a medicine called Feldine, um, which is a prescription medicine because uh, you only need to take it once a day, so it lasts a little bit longer. Um, physical therapy we'll use to try and help maintain the range of motion or stretch the joint out a little bit. Um, and then here a cortisone injection can also be useful in terms of making the pain better. We put it in a little bit different space, so in, or a little bit different spot. So instead of putting it up above the rotator cuff uh, in that subacromial bursa, we actually put the medicine in the joint itself and that will calm, calm down the inflammation and can often make people better, uh, sometimes for a few months, uh, sometimes for several years. Once all of those things stop working, uh, the next solution uh, here is surgery and the surgery consists of a joint replacement. Um, and so there are two types of shoulder replacements, one for each type of arthritis. So if your rotator cuff is working, uh, all we need to do is replace the cartilage. Um, and so what we do is we replace that with what we call an anatomic shoulder replacement which is a shoulder replacement that looks exactly like a normal shoulder. Um, so if you look here over on the left is that same patient uh, with the glenohumeral arthritis. Uh, and then in the center is a drawing of the shoulder replacement we use. So there's a metal stem um, that goes down uh, the humerus uh, that has a metal ball that sits on top of it. Uh, and then uh, there's a plastic uh, socket there, the glenoid component, uh, and that gets uh, cemented uh, into the shoulder blade. Uh, and so if you look on the right, uh, that's the same patient uh, after a shoulder replacement. Uh, and you can see the ball uh, and the stem. Uh, what you don't see is the socket, and that's because that's made out of plastic, and that doesn't show up on an x-ray. And so if you see that little uh, straight line, little metal straight line there, that's a marker that we put in the socket so that we know where it is. Um, and that tends to be a very good operation. Uh, you're in the hospital for one night afterwards, uh, a sling for the next six weeks because we do have to detach the subscapularis, the front rotator cuff muscle, in order to get to the shoulder. And so the purpose of the sling is to allow that to heal. And during that time, uh, we have the patients working with the physical therapist to move the shoulder some, but within a, a limited amount because we want to protect that repair. Uh, and then by six weeks, that's healed. So we come out of the sling and then we start uh, actively moving it and strengthening it. And typically, you need uh, about uh, four to four and a half months of uh, physical therapy and then it, like all joint replacements continues getting better and stronger for about 12 to 18 months after the surgery. And that is a great operation, uh, really gives very good results um, both uh, for pain relief uh, and uh, improving patient's function um, and it's proven to hold up uh, very, very well over time with uh, about a 90% survival rate uh, at 15 years. Um, and this, that picture on the right is two patients of mine or the, the, from Southern Maryland uh, where the nephew came up to see me. He got a shoulder replacement, was quite happy with it, and then uh, said, you know, it's really too bad that my aunt is too old for the surgery. Uh, and I said, you know, it's very rare that we ever tell somebody uh, who's healthy that they're too old for any surgery, especially this surgery. Um, and we'll do it, uh, people well into their 90s uh, who really will benefit from it. And so she came up and, and saw us, uh, and she actually got a shoulder replacement as well, and uh, both very happy. So 
The other type of arthritis, if you remember, is the rotator cuff tear arthropathy, and that's where you're missing both the cartilage as well as the rotator cuff. And so just like a normal shoulder needs a rotator cuff to function, a shoulder replacement needs a rotator cuff to function. So in that situation, what we have to do is use a special type of shoulder replacement called a reverse shoulder replacement. And what we're reversing is we're putting the ball on the socket side and the socket on the ball side. Uh, and that allows you to compensate both for the cartilage loss uh, and for the rotator cuff deficiency. So if you look at the picture over on the left, that's the picture we saw before uh, of the patient with <coughs> excuse me, rotator cuff tear arthropathy. Uh, and then if you look in the center, that's the reverse replacement. So again, uh, it's a uh, metal rod uh, going down the humeral bone, uh, but then sitting on top of that rod instead of the, the round ball, you see that plastic cuff. Uh, and then you know, moving uh, to the center there, you see the ball, and we mount the ball uh, with a metal plate uh, onto the socket. And so if you look over on the right, uh, that's what that looks like when it's all said and done. And again, similar sort of recovery, one night in the hospital, a little bit different here in that uh, we've changed the anatomy fairly drastically. Um, and so uh, we actually don't do any therapy at all for the first three weeks and we just uh, keep people in a sling uh, to let the arm get used to the new position. Uh, and then at that point, we're able to gradually increase the activity um, and uh, typically start some physical therapy at about six weeks. And again, about uh, three to four and a half months of uh, physical therapy. Uh, and patients continue to get better for about 12 to 18 months after the surgery. And again, this has uh, great results for pain relief, and it does significantly improve people's functions, although it never works quite as well uh, as a standard shoulder replacement, um, because again, we're trying to compensate for missing two different things. The other situation where we'll use this quite a bit um, is you know, in people that have had shoulder surgery, especially shoulder replacements or uh, surgery for fractures, um, that hasn't worked. Um, this tends to be a great operation, um, something we didn't have about 15 years ago, and it really gives us a much better way um, to help those people that we really had no option for, or uh, no ability to do before. So uh, in summary here, um, rotator cuff is the most common cause of pain in the shoulder. Um, almost everybody will have pain from it at some point in their life. Uh, it can almost always be made better with physical therapy. Um, occasionally it can't, um, and if it does require surgery, uh, we can do it arthroscopically. Uh, it's an involved recovery, but it tends to have excellent results. Um, and then uh, arthritis uh, is associated with decreased range of motion uh, and clicking or catching in the shoulder. Um, we can often make those symptoms better, uh, especially early on uh, without surgery. Uh, if we do need surgery, uh, shoulder replacement does tend to work uh, very well, both in terms of relieving the pain and bringing that function back much closer to normal. Thank you.